In this video, we will attempt to answer the question, what is a free group? To start with, what would it mean for a group to be free? The idea is that a group F would be free if it satisfied no other conditions than the group axioms. So F is kind of a minimally constrained group. So what properties might we expect from such a group? We should expect that the non-identity elements have infinite order. This is because there's nothing in the group axioms themselves which say that they need to have finite order. Likewise, we would expect free groups to be non-abelian because requiring a group to be abelian means imposing an extra condition along with the group axioms, the commutativity criterion. Of course, though, if we have two elements of the group F that are powers of a third element, then that is a condition in which those elements would commute. We would expect that all subgroups of free groups would be free. This is because supposing we have a subgroup of this group F and it were not free, that would mean it would satisfy extra axioms in a or extra conditions other than the group axioms. And because this subgroup is a subgroup of F, that would mean that this group F would satisfy some other conditions than the group axioms. So that would kind of contradict F being free. So we would expect that all subgroups of F ought to be free. Perhaps every group could be obtained as a quotient of some free group by adjoining relations, adding conditions to the free group until we wind up with the target group. And in a similar vein, perhaps if G is any group, then a free group F would allow for more homomorphisms from itself to G than other groups in some meaningful sense because F is minimally constrained. In this video and in the parts to follow, we will show that such groups do in fact exist and they satisfy these properties amongst others. So let's see if we can cook up an example of a free group. Suppose that a group G is generated by two elements, we'll call these A and B. This means that every element of G may be expressed as a word in the elements A, A inverse, B, B inverse. For instance, A, B gives us an element of G, as does A inverse, B, A, and B to the fourth, B inverse, A, B. G must have an identity element 1, but now note, of course, that because G is a group, it satisfies the inverses axiom. So the element 1 can certainly be expressed as, um, as a word in these elements. Now we can concatenate words on these elements and reduce them. So concatenation means, for instance, if we have the following words U and V, we put them together, that's the concatenation part, and the reduction part means that we are replacing instances of A, A inverse, B, B inverse, A inverse, A and B inverse, B with the identity element. So in this example, we have these words U and V. This is their concatenation. We note that we have this expression B inverse B here. This is a subword of the concatenated word UV. We replace B inverse B with the identity element. Now note we have the following subword A, A inverse. So we can reduce again to give us the following word A, B, A, which we cannot reduce any further. We call such a word reduced. The intuition here is that a reduced word does not contain any of these four expressions as subwords. Now it turns out that given any two words on these elements, this concatenation and reduction process always terminates and always gives us a unique reduced word, which we will denote by U star V. We will not prove this result here. So this star is giving us a binary operation on the set of all words on these elements. Now, if we forget that A and B are elements of a group G and just consider them as arbitrary letters, and we, we call that set A, 
we let FA denote the set of all reduced words on these four letters, A, A inverse, B, B inverse, we have the following result. FA, with this binary operation of star, forms a group with an identity element that we'll call epsilon, the empty word, the word of length zero. We will not prove this result here. From this, it follows that if G is any group and phi any map from this set A into G, then the map phi prime from FA into G, defined as follows, gives us a group homomorphism, where each of these xi's is in the set A, and each of the epsilon i's is in the set plus minus one. Note that when you restrict phi prime to A, you just get this map back. So what this result actually says, it says that phi prime extends this map from A into G. And this is really powerful. What this says is, it says that given any map from this set A into a, gr a group G, any group now, the map will extend to a group homomorphism phi prime from this group FA into the group G. Not only that, such an extension is unique. Given any map phi from this set A in, into a group G, it extends uniquely to give a group homomorphism from the group FA into G. And in fact, this result here will act as a definition for a free group that we will look at in the next part. A corollary from this result is that any group generated by two elements is a quotient of this group FA. To see this, consider any group generated by two elements, AB, let phi be the map from A into G, defined as follows. We send this letter A to this element A and the letter B to the element B. Then, by result two, that will extend to a group homomorphism from FA into G, but because this group G is generated by these two elements A, B, this map will actually be a surjection. Then by the first isomorphism theorem, we have that the group G is isomorphic to FA quotiented by the kernel of phi prime. And if we go all the way back and remind ourselves of what properties we would expect from a free group, We've shown that these two at the bottom here seem to be satisfied by the group FA that we just constructed. In the next part, we will formally define a free group and show that any set gives rise to a free group.